Fury. I'm a first grader that lives in Spokane, Washington, Spokane, and I. My question for you today is, what was your favorite book when you were a kid? That was perfect. Is in deep. What's it about? Hold it up. Skin Deep, what does it talk about? Skin Deep, what it talks about is what all of people's skin that is just like mine about. Talks about That's how everybody's awesome. skin color is different. Mm-hmm. And how we love di different people. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Kick it off to you. Go ahead. Okay, well, first of all, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Joel Ryan. I'm the executive director of the Washington State Association of Head Start and ECAP. We are a C3 uh, membership organization representing the Head Start and ECAP community. Um, we are joined in co-hosting this event today by Moms Rising, the Children's Alliance, the League of Education Voters, and the Washington Child Care Centers Association. Today's 30-minute webinar is part of a series of candidate forums focused on families with young children. Each of our recorded, uh, each of these are recorded and they're made publicly available on various digital platforms. As a 501c3 organization, we have reached out to each candidate running for this office. And if we have some time at the end, we will make some room for questions from all of you out there, your webinar attendees. Uh, but we are delighted today to be joined by a candidate for governor. I think many of you know him because he is the governor right now, Jay Inslee. Uh, Jay, I really uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, today's forum uh, is going to be moderated by Eric Corman from the League of Education Voters. So Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, Governor Inslee, thanks again uh, for making the time to join us today. Great. Well, hello. I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a sixth grader in the public school system. Since our forum today is focused on young children and families, our first question will come from Cadence. She's a first grade student at Longfellow Elementary in Spokane. Cadence, would you mind asking your question to the governor? Yeah. Hi, Cadence. My name is Cadence Fury. I'm a first grader from Spokane, Washington. And my question for you today was, what was your favorite book when you were a kid? Oh my gosh. Uh, Cadence, uh, you know, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, when I was your age, I think the books were on stone tablets, but I'm gonna try to remember what my favorite was. Uh, I read a book called Brave Men when I was about 11. It was about soldiers in a great war that hopefully will never happen again. And I remember that book quite well. Uh, and then I got a little older and then I read, read Moby Dick. So about every three years I read Moby Dick. Someday I hope you can read about Moby Dick. It's about a really uh, interesting whale. What's your favorite book? I was, uh, which, well, all of my favorite books, but I was reading this, this book. I just started reading it. Nice. That looks like an instructive, very important book right now. Uh, I'm going to try to send you a book, Cadence. I write a book every year at uh, holiday time for my grandchildren, so I'm going to send you one. That looks like a good one. I like that. Very timely. We were gonna, my family and I were gonna, we're gonna give, give you a copy of it. Oh my gosh, thank you because I can, my, uh, I have a second and third grader who are my grandchildren and I know they will like reading that. So thank you, I'll trade you. I'll send you a, a book called Bears in the Boat that I wrote last year. So if you like bears, I'll send you a book. You like bears? Yes. Okay, I'll send you a bears in the I boat. also like panda bears because my favorite animal are pandas. So right. I well, can you, never stop having bears. 
<laughs> I don't know what's cuter, you or panda bears. About a dead tie, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Cadence. Our next question comes from Karina Vega Villa from Wenatchee. She's a Moms Rising member, scientist, and program director at Wenatchee Valley College. As a community leader, Karina hears every day about the unmet needs of Latinx families in her community, especially those who are working in the fields and putting foods on our table. Karina? Yes, thank you, Eric. Um, the COVID-19 crisis is bringing to the forefront what many of us have long known, or social safety nets, including early learning and childcare programs are suffering from systemic underinvestment. And families, especially black, indigenous, and people of color and the identifying families are suffering as a result. Especially with a looming budget crisis, how do you envision rebuilding or social safety nets? How will you ensure that families who are undocumented will benefit from the safety net? Well, thank you and thanks for your leadership. Uh, we know these families are some of the most, uh, the hardest working families. Uh, they're so important to us, certainly in the agricultural industry and many other industries. And, and they have been hardest hit by the COVID pandemic there's been a disproportionate infection rate among Latinx families that's quite extraordinary. So it's the right moral thing to do to help them, both in the short term and long term. I am pleased that we have just started the distribution of a $40 million fund, which I established using some of the CARES money that will be available to undocumented working people in our state. That is extremely important for the well being of their families. These are families who are working, they are paying taxes, they're uh, enjoying and coaching soccer. And uh, this is a thing for the health of their families and our whole community. We've also established a three and a half million dollar fund so that families in the agricultural industry who have to quarantine can also keep their, their wages going. Now, that's directly to some of the the, uh, the undocumented worker folks, but we need to obviously do much more uh, for the broader long-term efforts in childcare, certainly. That's why I'm pleased we distributed $61 million in our first tranche, our first uh, sequence of childcare assistance. There will be another $70 million we'll be distributing that will go for a, a partially for re a reduction of co-payments that families would have to pay and partially just to help the childcare uh, providers. These are short term. Now we've also, we know how committed we all are to expansion of early child education. This is something I've been working on since 1989 when I voted for the Children's Initiative. And uh, we've got more work to do. We've made some progress on that, as you know, the last few budget cycles, but we have much more work to do. I will also point to the broader context of your question, which is how do we help the economic uh, circumstances of working families. And we have led the nation in that regard. Due to the work of many of the people on this call, we've passed the best paid family and medical leave law in the United States. That's something we should be very proud of. We have, uh, I have by my executive order or my Department of Labor at my direction, I uh, have the best overtime protection so that working people get paid for overtime. When you're away from your family, you ought to get paid for overtime. We've adopted that. We have the highest minimum wage. I'm proud that a variety of people that have looked at this have said that the state of Washington is the single best pay place for working families in the United States. And we're not done yet. So I look forward to working with you and uh, continuing to help out. Thank you very much, Karina. The next question comes from Nicole Etheridge, a WSA parent ambassador, a preschool teacher, and a mom from Kettle Falls in Northeastern Washington. As a preschool teacher, she knows and advocates for programs like ECAP, the State Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program. Nicole? Good afternoon. My question for you uh, is, um, ECAP is a high quality comprehensive learning program that serves some of the most at-risk families. Uh, research uh, shows that investments in programs like ECAP pay off, particularly for uh, disadvantaged children and families. 
It also is a critical part of our childcare infrastructure in Washington State. Um, do you support increase, increasing ECAP funding? Why or why not? Well, uh, I support it for many reasons. I'll give you uh, the first reason. Uh, your organization has a secret lobbyist. I just want to introduce you to her. This is your secret lobbyist that you have working for you, Annie Hazel Hinsley. Hinsley. She's about 11 months now. And uh, that's a really good reason to support ECAP. Uh, I, I don't know your age. I think I probably voted for expansion of early child education before you were born, <laughs> I suspect, <laughs> in 1989. <laughs> and, and I have been a firm believer in this because it is the best investment that we can make in public spending bar none. This gets us the most social benefit, the healthiest people, the, the most stable families, the most economically productive. And importantly, I want to mention this. Somebody asked me, you know, when we had a discussion about ending racial inequities in our society, I believe this is probably the single best thing we can do to racial, to, to uh, attack the racial disparities that we have, that we have suffered. We cannot accept the fact that, you know, children of, of color uh, don't, don't arrive in, in kindergarten and first grade uh, ready. And we have got to get every kid ready when they start these programs. And early childhood is absolutely pivotal to this. So yes, uh, I have supported, we have had expansion in a variety of ways, as you know. We've also focused on high quality uh, early child education and high quality child care. And I'm happy that we've helped providers in multiple ways uh, uh, increase their skill sets to do this. So we have done some, we are gonna do a lot more. Uh, you know, we have some budget challenges in our state, but we also know the criticality of this and that we want to continue to build this most important investment. I'm serious. I don't know what a better investment is for, for a citizen's or taxpayer's dollar than a dollar that goes into early child education. And so thanks to everybody who's working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Nicole. Our next question comes from Roshana Booker. She's a Moms Rising member from South Seattle. As a new mom to baby Malcolm Zion and a former childcare provider, now student, Roshana knows the importance of childcare for families and the importance of living wages for providers. Roshana. Hi. Hello. It's nice to meet you and I really appreciate all your hard work. <laughs> you too. Mom's rising, you know, family medical leave, what they've done. It's been an incredible organization. It has been. I just joined and I'm really honored. So I Great appreciate group. So my question for you is, child care providers are some of the lowest paid workers, oftentimes making less than parking lot attendants and dog worker and dog walkers, while families struggle to afford and find affordable child care. We also know that child care is paramount to our state's economic recovery. What is your plan to make child care more affordable for families while increasing wages and benefits for workers to help stabilize the market? Well, this is certainly a challenge. We know this is a pivotal profession and uh, we have got to make it a living wage for families. Uh, we've started that, as I indicated, on our short-term investment. Of, it'll be about $130 million of CARES dollars that will go into the care, child care uh, industry writ large to help families so that they can have reduced copay, but also help the child care providers. Uh, we were able to preserve, even though we have had to do some very painful cuts this year through vetoes, we preserved the increase in child care reimbursement rate. It was small, but it was a first step. So we've made some first steps in this regard. Um, and, and we're gonna continue to build on that. I, I can't tell you right now in a dollars or cents uh, uh, commitment right now what will be in our next budget because we have to see what our financial circumstance will be. As you know, we are very hopeful that Congress will get off the dime and provide dollars that can be used for these purposes coming out of uh, the stimulus plan. We are very, very hopeful that Nancy Pelosi has a victory like many of her victories um, and uh, frankly overcomes resistance from Mitch McConnell that can provide us some money so we can make investments of this nature. So we're really 
really hopeful that Nancy and the Democrats prevail in this regard. So thank you for being such an advocate. Again, thanks for Moms Rising for what you're doing. By the way, I hope, I hope Moms Rising and other groups are thinking about sort of the larger issues, even larger than, than the ones we've talked about. I, for instance, I think there's a, we, we're deciding who's gonna be the next superintendent of public construction. And I have really enjoyed uh, working with Chris uh, on issues of integrating uh, our efforts in public education and early child education so we can get the biggest bang for our buck with the highest quality that we can. He has been such a super champion on investments in education, including on these measures. And I really hate to think he could be replaced by someone who actually wants to cut $2.4 billion from our educational funding. I just find that unbelievable somebody would run for superintendent of public education wanting to cut funding in public education. That's what his opponent wants to do. So I'm hopeful that you and everybody on this call is interested in maintaining a person who's really been such a partner of mine in breakfast after the bell, uh, billions of more dollars for our schools, improving an ECAP, uh, greater uh, training for our educators. We need uh, a person of that type of leadership. And you can, you can tell them I said so. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Roshana. Our next question comes from Scarlett, another Moms Rising member and program associate for WSA Head Start and ECAP. She's from Maple Valley, a University of Washington alumna and mom to two young children who organized and advocated in support of paid family and medical leave in Washington. Scarlett. Thank you. Um, my question is um, only about 5% of eligible families in Washington receive home visiting services. Um, but we know that the first three years of life are among the most important and most stressful. What are your plans to support new parents and caregivers? Um, are you going um, to work towards expanding policy like pay family and medical leaves, um, early ECAP and home visiting? Well, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. All of those things have tremendous value. Uh, we have this effort of, and we did some things to preserve some of the complex, I can't remember the nomenclature, the complex uh, wraparound service program that can help, I think, in this regard. Uh, we preserve that. We'd like to expand that in, in all its uh, dimensions. I just really believe in this. Uh, my wife, Trudy, was involved in a home visiting program when we were in Yakima in the 70s and early 80s. And we just saw very great values for families, you know, just giving them a little mentorship on occasion, a little emotional support. And I saw that firsthand how Trudy's work really helped uh, some young families. So I'm a believer in the value of these, these services. I'm also a believer in all the policies that your organization has, allow, has allowed to blossom in the state of Washington, which gives families better economic resources in general that can help with these issues. Look, we gotta end this horrendous economic inequality in our society. Uh, it, you know, the fact that virtually all of the gains in our society are going up to the top 1% while so many families are struggling. We need to fundamentally end not only racial disparities, but economic disparities. And all of these things play into that, that mission statement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Scarlett. Our next question comes from Jessica. She's a WSA parent ambassador from Federal Way who works for Federal Way School District. She has three beautiful children and knows firsthand how hard it is for Native American families to find and afford dental and medical care. Mm -hmm. Jessica. Hello, sorry, my device was being slow. <laughs> Data shows that at least 40% of kids with medical dental coverage don't see a dental professional in any given year. Kids of color have the least access, often experience the worst outcomes. And all but one county in Washington has a dental provider shortage. This is an access crisis that's worsening in the pandemic. What would you do to respond 
to this problem, increase our dental provider workforce and make it more representative of communities most impacted by the barriers to care? Well, a really important question. The first thing I do is to prevent Donald Trump from stripping 800,000 people from their health insurance. That's the first thing. And that's very important. That is at risk. And it's important to realize you've got sometimes to defend what you've got. And we have health and care, care insurance for 800,000 people that is at risk today uh, in the Supreme Court. And so I'm hopeful that we elect uh, Vice President Biden, who will stand by and increase with a public option increase the availability of health insurance. But as you indicated, we still, the dental disparities are profound. There's a variety of things we have to do. One, we have to increase the diversity of our, our people going through dental school. So we have more diversity in that regard. Uh, second, we've got to have more community-based uh, networks and providers so that we have people close where the community actually uh, lives. We also, I believe, think to continue to look at the possibilities uh, that on some of our tribal communities have shown of having uh, uh, dental folks uh, that can do some of the work now safely and professionally so that there's decreased, co decreased costs. That, that is an issue that I think is worthy of consideration to reduce costs associated um, with this. Now, we also have to, in my book, have more health-related professionals in our schools to monitor the conditions of our kids, both health, both physical and mental. Uh, last year, I tried to increase the number of counselors who would have uh, uh, health training to help with the health of, of kids, mostly mental health, but physical as well, to be able to see kids who had uh, you know, developing problems. So there's a variety of things. And then um, tell them they can only eat one bag of candy uh, for Halloween. So that's my other solution. Thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate that. We have time for one, maybe two questions. Joel, I understand you had a question about the tax code. I do. Um, as you know, uh, Governor Inslee, Washington State has the most upside down tax code in the nation. As our state grapples with its current budget crisis, we can't make the same mistakes of the past that led to devastating budget cuts and higher aggressive taxes on struggling families. Do you support policies like new progressive revenue and a new working families tax credit to low income families to help our state navigate this crisis and make our tax code more equitable and fair? Well, it is premature to take a position specifically on the question you asked, we've got to know what the financial position is in December to be really, to figure out what our, what our budget actually will look like. Uh, what I can tell you right now, I will produce a balanced budget and I will propose that in December. I will be protective of the things that I have been protective of, that I believe uh, very passionately about and what we've been talking about fits those qualifications. Uh, uh, if there, and this is an if with a capital I, if there was new revenue uh, necessary, uh, you know that I have supported progressive approaches so that that burden does not fall on working families, that it would fall on, you know, the top 1%. And that is, I'm not saying that will happen because we don't know our, our, our situation yet. But if that is required to have revenues, we need to do it on a much fairer uh, basis. And what I'm, what I'm referring to, as you know, I've, I've supported in the past uh, a capital gains provision. Now, I'm not proposing that now. I don't know if that'll be necessary and don't know if it'll be in my budget, but it is the kind of thing that would be fair. All right, thank you very much, Joel. Our last question is about K-12 education, and it comes from Dr. Stefan Blanford, Executive Director of the Children's Alliance and former board member of Seattle Public Schools. Stefan. Thank you, Governor. Students of color, English language learners, students with disabilities and other marginalized groups are experiencing substantial learning loss because of remote learning. What meaningful and actionable steps can be done in the legislative session to show that these students are families, that the legislature is listening to their needs? Yeah, this is a huge concern because we know that educators are doing 
tremendously innovative and creative and hard work. I talked to a teacher from Decatur Federal Way, you know, the other day says I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning trying to get these, the most innovative curriculum I can through remote learning. But you just cannot, there's just no way physically we can connect with maybe 20% of the children right now. I was on a call with a whole group of principals about this issue today. So we know there's going to be a deficit that we have to make up to these children. And uh, we don't know exactly the best way to do that. What I can tell you is we this legislative session, we should not wait. This legislative session, we should design a system to make up for the deficit that these children are gonna experience. Now, obviously those deficits are largest on children of poverty, children of color, children with special needs. We'll have to make sure those are evaluated first, if you will, but all children to some degree are, you know, they're not gonna have what they normally have had. So uh, I don't have the answer on the best way to do that, but we are starting to give serious thought to that. Um, Challenge, uh, Challenge Seattle, uh, a group of some business leaders, are, all, are they're gonna make a proposal on this, which I will be interested to see. I would love to work with everybody on this call about your ideas about the best way to go about that. Does it mean additional mentoring for students? Does it mean additional days at some place? Uh, I don't know the best way to do that, but we got to figure it out because we know there will be sig significant deficits and they can be profound. I was on one uh, talking to a principal of a small town in Eastern Washington today. And he said like a third of their children had, you know, apps virtually across the board right now. And boy, that's just not fair to our kids. So I'll look forward to working with you and everybody on this call. I hope to design that kind of system uh, to make up for this. Now, having said that, I want to reiterate my admiration, admiration for educators has always been very, very deep. I'm the son and brother and brother-in-law of teachers, and they are doing incredible work right now, but they're just up against some limitations. A lot of kids don't have good enough connectivity. That's why I'm putting in $24 million to buy more laptops and, and hotspots for people. That's not quite done yet. I have to get legislators kind of sign off on that first, but I, I'm reasonably hopeful it'll help them. It'll happen. Um, I just want to tip of the cat to these educators what they're doing. Great. Thank you, Dr. Blanford. And thank you, Governor Inslee, for joining us today. We know you have to go to another call. We wish you the best of luck in your race, and I hope you have a great weekend. Joel, you turn it back to you. Yes. Hope I uh, can take care, everybody. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, thanks, Governor Inslee, for joining us and everybody um, that had an opportunity to watch this webinar. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> I look forward to my book. I'm going to read it to my grandkids pretty soon. My mom voted for you. Oh, great. <laughs> we're going to lower the voting age. Probably should. <laughs> we'll see you all. Thank you, Governor. Bye, everybody.